Hi everyone, Mick Make Mail number 14. We have Sonoffs, we have a Bluetooth module from IC Station, we have something I picked up from a garbage bin, and oh, this is something else that I picked up from a garbage bin, which you'll absolutely like. Oh, there's also a big package from Synology. So Synology uh, contacted me uh, to see if I wanted to do a couple of tutorials on one of their products. So I agreed to it and I'm going to be shortly uh, running a couple of uh, simple tutorials on one of their products, which would be nice. This is one of our uh, first sponsors that I've uh, looked at uh, to help run this channel. So what they've given me is uh, the DS416, uh, which is a fairly basic Synology NAS device. So let's have a look at it. <coughs> so it comes in a fairly uh, neat package. They haven't given me uh, hard disks uh, or any other bits for, for me to do the tutorial, so we'll have to get those. Uh, but we'll plug it in and have a look at it and see how it goes. Okay, so power cable, uh, of course, a US-based power cable, which I'll just need to swap out. Um, of course, we get all the information, uh, network cables. Uh, what else do we have? A power pack. It's a 12-volt, 7.5-amp uh, battery pack. Fairly beefy. Uh, what else? Oh, this is filler. And this is the actual NAS box. Seem to be acquiring a lot of rubbish. So this this is a NAS box uh, from Synology. It can accommodate uh, four uh, discs, and uh, it's got two LAN ports, gigabit LAN ports, USB on the back. Um, and I think I'll need to look this up, but I'm not sure if these are hot swappable or not. It's a fairly simple. Uh, RAID array, uh, just attach the disk in here and slot it in. So installing a hard drive is pretty basic into one of these cradles. I just pull this little tab off uh, on both sides, uh, chuck the hard disk in uh, and then put this back on again. I mean look, it's fairly straightforward uh, and it holds the hard disk in place while you insert it or remove it. Just make sure you put it in the right way. There you go. Power it up and see what it looks like. So once you've got um, Ethernet and uh, the power, it should be just a simple matter of turning it on. Okay, so it seems that um, you need to actually connect it into LAN port 2, not LAN port 1. I wasn't getting any sort of response out of it, so uh, it's stopped blinking. Uh, well, the power light stopped blinking, but the uh, status light is blinking now. So the NAS box came up with uh, this IP address without issue. Uh, and I did a quick port scan uh, which showed up the usual website ports. So just point your browser at the IP address. So it seems the NAS box has just enough firmware to run the basics uh, but you'll need to install some software called Disk Station Manager which I've been told is a plain Linux distro. So download the PAT file, upload that to the NAS box which seems to install it directly onto your hard disk instead of any onboard flash. So it takes a fair while to complete, but once done, go through creating your admin account and a couple of other questions. You can also create a quick connect account, which allows you to connect to your NAS box remotely. So it's all pretty easy going so far. So the NAS box seems to have uh, all the stuff you'd expect from a NAS box. SMB, NFS, AFP, TFT, TFTP, uh, Sync, Bonjour, User Control, oh, two-step verification, that's nice, Active Directory, LDAP, DDDNS, PPOE, Tunneling, VLANs, DHCP server, and if you have a Wi-Fi dongle, it'll use that as well, firewalling, DDoS protection, notifications, power control, wake on LAN, UPS, Shared folder syncing, yeah, seems to have it all. I did notice that it runs a dual-core Alpine AL212, 
which is a common arm sock used in a bunch of other NAS boxes like the uh, QNAP uh, NAS box. Oh, you can enable SSH, nice. Okay, let's crack open our shell and see what's running. So it seems to be a plain old Linux shell. DMessage came up with some interesting stuff like PCIe interfaces. And yep, it's a plain old ARM sock. And there's several serial ports with a console attached to. And you can very easily drop into root. It runs a fairly old kernel version, which is a bit of a shame, but not really a massive problem. And the distro seems to be loosely based off Debian, although there's no apt config directory. The OS is installed onto a plain old Linux RAID volume. I only have one disk in there currently, which seems to be a plain old Linux install. Uh, and you have complete access to modify. Now that's really cool. There's nothing worse than having a Linux based NAS system that you can't modify. Another nice thing is that there's some GPIOs, ITC and SPI. Nice. So unfortunately no SPI device driver, but there's certainly ITC and you can access the GPIOs in the normal way. So it'll be interesting to crack that open and see what it looks like. Uh, Synology also provide a bunch of apps which I know you can get under normal Linux. For example, you can install WordPress with a simple click uh, and it just runs without issue. So from unpacking to running a WordPress site, you could easily do that within a couple of minutes. You can also manage your MySQL database from the shell. So that's really nice. So that's it for the Synology NAS box. I'll have a couple of tutorials uh, up and running in a couple of weeks. Uh, so stay tuned for that. So next up on the list. So two Sonoff devices that I ordered some time ago. I haven't had a chance to play around with them. There's the power module, which allows you to monitor current and voltage. Also this plane module, which allows you to turn uh, devices on and off. So they both turn devices on and off. This one is the current and voltage logger and this one is just a plain on off switch. So let's crack them open and see how they go. Now as I mentioned before in Australia we legally can't actually modify our own electrical supply which is a bit of a shame. Uh, so do that at your own risk otherwise you might uh, be faced with some fines. Now you're supposed to hold this button down for seven seconds. And yeah, that's about it. So it's blinking at that rate, which means I need to go to my iPhone, select that, and select that. Then once you've uh, selected that, you've got to join the access point that that has created, and which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it's password. Once it's connected, you flick back to the EWI link application. Then you can configure the Wi-Fi access point that you want to connect to. So it's configuring your access point details on the actual uh, Sonoff device. So I've connected up my soldering iron to the Sonoff and it should be able to just turn it straight on. Nice. Look at that. Now I know there's some issues with security on these Sonoff devices and a lot of people have been reflashing them. I won't do it in this video, uh, but I'll certainly show how to do that in a later video. So the Sonoff power measurement device has these little push-in connectors instead of uh, screws. You've got the earth neutral and live on one side and live earth neutral on the other side, so it's fairly easy to put in. So there we have it, we have an in and an out. It'll be interesting to see what sort of current and uh, voltage measurements we can get from it. So it seems to be the same sort of setup as last time. Just press and hold the button for seven seconds until it starts blinking. Then go and add a device, the same sort of process. So we should be able to turn the device on. 
Nice. And turn it off. And also this app has power and current measurements, which is nice. So look, as a as a, a rough thing, the Sonos are pretty good, but once again, you need to look at reflashing the firmware because there are some security issues with the, the default Sonoff and EWI link um, software. So that's what a lot of people tend to be doing. So probably the next Mic Make Mail segment, I'll look at uh, reflashing uh, the firmware and show you how easy it is. So next up, we have this RFID scanner. Uh, it's a fairly simple one. It's based on the very common RC522 um, chip, RFID chip. So let's uh, solder it up, crack it open and see what we can get out of it. So for this one, I'm going to use uh, JP Lou's very excellent stem terraboard, uh, which should be a nice uh, test for that one as well. So the Arduino IDE has an excellent RC522 library inbuilt, so just uh, download that, install it. There's also some example code, which is the dump info sketch, which I just loaded up and uh, ran. So it's fairly straightforward, I've just connected up to the SPI bus uh, on the stem terror. So all I have to do is put a tag near it and you'll be able to see the data appear on the serial port. And the same with the uh, card itself. So look, it's pretty straightforward. It's, you've got a library for it, um, plenty of software around for it. Let's try the advanced example and see how that goes. So this is a pretty good example of a door lock application. You start off with a master card. So the master card programs the actual door lock. Then you can enter in the master card again which allows you to add new devices. So I've got a little fob keychain RFID tag. And so that adds it, exit program mode. And then you can come along and just unlock the door. Nice, that's pretty easy. How much simpler can you get than this? All right, that works. On to the next thing. So this next one I picked up from IC Station. It's an NRF52832 uh, development module. It's a pretty standard one. So let's uh, connect it up to something and see how it goes. So after a couple of hours of um, fiddling around with the NRF52832 module, um, I decided not to include it in this particular Mic Make Mail. The reason being is I didn't have a JTAG header. So I had to use a Raspberry Pi as a JTAG. Uh, to simulate a JTAG. This required open OCD and a whole bunch of other stuff so it actually deserves a video on itself. So I'll make a quick bits video on open OCD, how to connect up and use your Raspberry Pi as a JTAG uh, converter uh, and program NRFs, ESPs and a whole lot of other things. So I'll leave that for another video. Next. Now this next one is pretty unique. In fact, I think I might have the only board in existence on the planet. This is quite an interesting board. So it's essentially an all-winner A10 module. Uh, it has two gigs of RAM on it. Uh, it's got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, HDMI, audio, SD slot. It's got everything in this tiny little package. Uh, I found this uh, lying around in a in a bunch of rubbish essentially and it had it fortunately had an SD card on it and uh, this SD card actually was working I'll show you what it looks like So all I'm doing here is just uh, checking to see what is on the uh, file system. Uh, there's a plain old boot image uh, and it looks like it's based loosely on Ubuntu at least. And there's this reference to MIDI AND which is, uh, which is fortunate because this is how I discovered uh, the company name. So it turns out MIDI AND was an Aussie based company that went bust around 2013. There's a couple of references on websites about how it went bust. 
there's even an old Reddit forum for Mini Ant. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist at all anymore. Even more, unfortunately, there's nothing more on this board. What I think has happened is that QB Board bought up the company shortly after it went bust and turned that into the original QB Board. So I've connected everything up, uh, HDMI, USB, keyboard, mouse, uh, and then all we need is the juice. And everything actually starts up, which is quite amazing. So it does take a while to boot up. So there we have it. Um, I've already changed the root password. It's a fully working board uh, with all winner A10 on it. I mean, it's incredible. It's a tiny little board. And this was actually made uh, around five years ago too. And look, this is a, an, an all winner A10 in this tiny little module. Okay, so what I can see, uh, we've got 512 megs of RAM, an uh, all winner A10 uh, onboard EMMC, SD card, audio codec, uh, there's also an RTL 8192 Wi Fi and Bluetooth modem, uh, USB ports, HDMI out, it's still fairly well contained. So it's uh, similar to the original QB board, and I, I suspect that QB board probably bought this off Minian, the Australian company and just started selling it as a QB board, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. So anyway, that's uh, pretty interesting. I'm probably the only one uh, in the world who has one of these that's actually working. So that's uh, quite interesting, a good find too. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, we have the Sonoffs, which I'll start to use uh, quite extensively. The RFID tag uh, Bluetooth module, which I'll have an upcoming video on this, on how to really fully program that. Um, and this exotic board that uh, will actually be quite handy. There's no GPIOs on this one, so anyway. And also the uh, Synology NAS, which should be uh, quite good to work with as well. So that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. See you next week.